Deliverance Revival Tabernacle Church presents The Time Is Now with Pastor E.I. Osborne Jr. and friends reaching souls unlimited with the gospel of Jesus Christ raising up Jesus believers throughout New England, the nation, Canada, and the world. And now, our pastor, E.I. Osborne Jr. Well, praise the name of Jesus, for he's worthy to be praised. I'm Pastor Osborne. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of The Time Is Now radio and television program. It's my prayer and sincere hope that God will use this program and use us right now as an instrument to minister to your needs, and I'm certain that God is going to do just that. So, we have a word that we're going to share with you today. As always, God gives us a word, and typically we come to the studio, we minister the word that we ministered on Sunday. So, not an excuse for you not being in church or not being there, but you kind of get to hear what we talked about uh, in our Sunday service. Now, as always, we're just trying to yield to the Holy Spirit, and let Him have His way. You know, what I understand is this, God knows exactly, exactly who will be watching this program. We also do a radio program. We take some of the audio from this that we're taping right now, video in the studio, and we take the audio and we use it for our radio program as well. So I realize that there are people that are going to see this on television and the different cable access channels that were on, Cambridge and Malden and Midford and so on, and Plymouth and all that. Um, but also people are going to be listening on radio, which could be all over, really, because radio now you can even listen on online all over the world. And so my desire is to hear from the Holy Spirit and let Him direct me as to what He wants me to say. As of right now, I have a few things I think He's taking me to, but we are yielded to Him. He can switch it, change it, turn it, and do whatever He wants done because that's what it's all about. That way, you get what you need, and I get what I need, which is well done, good and faithful servant. So, but God is good all the time. I hope you're having a great time. You know, summer is upon us. It's, it's, it's getting warm. It's warm and all that. And so that's great for those of you who like the, the warmer weather in the summer months and all like that. So, but God is good. In the midst of whatever it is, God is good. So I want to get into this word. Go to our YouTube channel. Let me just invite you to do that as well. Go to our YouTube channel. So go to YouTube and search E. I Osborne, just like you see at the bottom of the screen, and you'll find our channel. There's live videos that, that we do at church and Bible study, on uh, live Bible study, and then also there uh, you'll also see some, some videos that are some messages that are recorded like this, but there's a few hundred, you know, seven, eight hundred, whatever, and, um, you know, you should find whatever, you know, sometimes you have a question about something or you need a word about something or whatever. If you, if you scroll through, you'll see some titles that hopefully will, will be a message that will minister to your need, okay? So check it out, click on it, watch it, and after you enjoy it, which I'm sure you will, click the like button. And the like button is a thumbs up. I have to tell people that because people always tell us, I can't find the like button. Well, it's, it's, it's just, there's a thumbs up, there's a thumbs down. You don't want to hit that one. Hit the thumbs up. And then even more importantly, subscribe because we'd love to increase the number of subscribers, and then share the video. You can share it with your friends and family and all that. Listen, come, come check us out Sunday mornings, uh, Deliverance Revival Tabernacle, 298 High Street in Duxbury. 298 High Street, Duxbury, Sundays at 10 a.m. We'd love to have you come fellowship with us, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to minister to those that you've allowed to be listening and watching right now. You're an awesome God. You're good all the time. Bless the word. I yield. I surrender to you right now. Have your way. You know who's watching. You know what they need to hear. You know, Lord, what you want me to say. So say what you want said. Do what you want done. And I thank you in advance that you're going to confirm this word with miracles, signs, and wonders. You're going to confirm this word with a manifestation of the, the, the gifts of the Spirit. And, Lord, for everything that I believe you're going to do, I give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. And I thank you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay? <clears throat> so... We weren't in the studio. We didn't come to the studio uh, last week because uh, it was a holiday. And so took that time to take a break. And every now and then, it's good to have a break. You know, I try to be pretty faithful with my coming to the studio when, when it's available. And uh, because there are times when it's not. So when it is, I try to make sure I take advantage of it. But then when there's a holiday and they're closed for the holiday because they need a break. Everyone need, you know, we all need a break. Thank God for holidays. I take my break as well. I can maybe you know, possibly reschedule or do something, but we all need a break. So 
weren't here. So I'm going to start with something that I talked about, ministered a couple of weeks ago, okay? So, you know, we're living in the last days. Jesus is soon to come. And, you know, I've heard people lately talking about God being in control. God is in control. God. And some people have the perception that when you say God is in control, it means that God controls everything that happens in the world. Everything that happens, everything and anything that happens in the world, God controlled it almost like he did it and so on. Well, it's not so much that God did it, but sometimes it may be that God allowed it. And the reason God allowed it isn't necessarily because it was his will. So ultimately, everything that happens in this world is not God's will. You know, uh, uh, so let me give you a scripture for that. So 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, I believe, in verse 18. Everything that happens in this world is not God's will. Now, there are people that believe that everything that happens is God's will, and they look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 to maybe could, to prove that it is God's will because of what 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 says. But they're really kind of misinterpreting the, what, 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 what God is saying to us in that verse, okay? Everything that happens, because there are things that happen in this world. Yes, God allowed it. Some things God does, some things God allows, okay? But he allows some things because we have free will. And because of our free will, if we choose to do something and want to do it or whatever, God, even though he could stop it, he, he, but because we have free will, he allows it, all right? He allows it. So Adam in the garden, Eve, she's deceived. She eats of the fruit. She brings it to Adam. And you know what? He ate of the fruit. Could God have stopped that? Yes. But then that would, that would, that would uh, 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 eliminate the whole purpose of him giving us free will. He wants us to choose. And I have a message. I think it's on YouTube as well. I know I have it on a video, uh, something like that, a DVD or something that we used to give out. But the message is called Why Free Will? Why Free Will? Well, you know, God gave Adam and Eve, God gave mankind his creation free will <clears throat> because ultimately God wants to be loved. You know, the first commandment, love the Lord your God with all your, your heart, your soul, your mind, and so on. God wants to be loved. He wants us, he wants us to love him, all right? <clears throat> but love that's coerced, that, that's forced, right? You, if you're made to love someone, then that's not love. And ultimately, that leads to, uh, 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 you know, anger. It leads to different things. But God wants to, and he wants the love to be of our own choice and desire, Okay. He wants us to love him, but he wants us to love him of our own choice, free will, and so on. So he gave us free will so that we could choose to love him, follow him, or not, all right? And so because of that free will, also there are things that God will allow because we want it, and so on, and, and he allows it to happen. So uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, it says, In everything give thanks. In everything give thanks. Not for everything, but in everything. You know, if you just got a bad doctor's diagnosis or uh, uh, you, you just had an accident or something, you don't give God thanks for it, but you give God thanks in it. And you're thanking him because you know he promised to give you the victory, make everything work together for good and so on, all right? But it says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, I used to believe that that verse meant everything that happens is God's will and I should just give God thanks for it. You know, because he's going to make it, yeah, because he's going to make it work together for good, like I said, and all like that. But because it's God's will, oh, and don't, don't you want God's will? Of course you do. So just give God thanks. Somebody just got murdered. Hey, hallelujah. You know, so we should just get, because it's the will of God. That's not what that means. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Well, you know, everything that happens is not God's will. So if someone had a terrible accident, they were killed. Was that God's will? No. You know, someone else had stage four cancer. Is that God's will? No. All right. Someone else had a miscarriage. Was that God's will? No. You know, everything about God is good. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. The, 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 the creator and, 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 and the one that uh, uh, fathers and creates and causes and, and, and is, the, is the blame or whatever, the source, I should say, maybe of all evil and negative and sickness and disease Everything evil and wicked you can think of in this world, sickness, disease, poverty, lack, accidents, the, the, the source of all of that is the devil, Satan, okay? If, if, if Adam did not sin, in, in, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, it tells us that sin came into the world and death by sin. If Adam didn't sin, 
there would be no death and nothing to cause death. Can you imagine no accidents, whether it's someone walking, whether it's someone driving? I don't know if we'd have cars if, if, if Adam didn't seem like he probably wouldn't need cars. But, you know, whatever, no accident. No one's going to walk through the garden at the, in, the, in the cool of the day or whatever and trip over a rock, bump their head, and die, okay? Or, or some, or, and all that. No death, no sickness, no, de no disease, no death. And I think even no, you know, we think of the, 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 the seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall. Well, if there would have been seasons, they, would, they wouldn't be like what we think of seasons today. There would not be a fall where the leaves die and fall off the trees and turn brown and we rake them up. None of that because there's no death. No death, right? They just would have, if they change colors, they just go from change. In the seasons, they go from one color to the next to the next. Not one of them die. Not one leaf falls off a tree. No death, but death and sickness and disease and all the evil and murders and thefts and all that kind of stuff all comes because of sin. It's all, it's all of the devil. Now, God knew Adam would sin, but what did God do? God prepared a way for, of salvation. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world because he gave him free will. So God knew that he would do that, and he allowed it. He allowed it because Adam had free will. He had to allow him to do that. But what did God do? He created a way of salvation. By, by, by the sacrifice, the suffering, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the shedding of the blood of his only begotten son. John the Baptist said, he is the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So what does this mean? Let me, let me get back to this because I'm kind of going off. In everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Well, let me say it this way. The will of God, if I said, if I said the second part first, the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you is that in everything you give thanks. See, ultimately what God wants, and, and there's, a, there's actually a translation, I don't know if I have time to find it, that kind of puts it a little more like that. And that's just a little revelation that God gave me on that verse. That everything that happens, when you had a, someone had an accident, that don't, oh, this, it's God's will. No, that wasn't God's will. Someone had a miscarriage, well, it's God's will. No, that wasn't God's will. God's will is not death. God's will is life, right? He is the... God is the essence of life. God is life. He is life. He's light. He's love, right? So that miscarriage was not God's will. That accident was not God's will. That heart disease is not God's will, all right? But in the midst of the things that we face in this life, knowing the promises, the victory that God has promised, knowing who God is, knowing what God's going to do, in the midst of it, in it, not for it, but in the midst of it, we give God thanks. Lord, I thank you. Not for it, but in it knowing that in, although in this life, in this world, I'm going to suffer, we're going to suffer tribulation and trouble and problems and things are going to come and all like that. And thank God Jesus is going to come and fix it all. But in the meantime, Lord, I just choose because I know you're good. You cannot lie. You're going to make it work together. You're going to fix it. You're going to help me. I give you thanks. All right. We praise him and we thank him for his goodness and his grace and his mercy. But let me see if I can find this real quick. Let me see. First Thessalonians, I'm going to look on my phone here and see if I have because I saw it, I, like I said, it's just a revelation. It's not something, unless God, there's some things that God has to give you, even Jesus. You know, people that are born again, they get saved. It's because they have a revelation. It's not so much that they, they, they just study it and read it. But let me, let me see here. Let me see if I can find this real quick. First Thessalonians 5. I'll take the time to do it because if I can give you an actual something that you can read and look at for yourself, that might help. Let me see here. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so even like, the, say, the Amplified, classic Amplified, it says, thank God in everything, no matter what the circumstances may be, may be, be thankful and give thanks. For this is, well, this is the will of God who, uh, 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 for you who are in Christ Jesus. Let me see, that's not it. Let me see here. Um, yeah, uh, let me see here. No, I don't know if I can find it. But, but basically, just, just hear me when I tell you that what God's desire is, is that, and here's, here's, here's the key word. Here's, man, here's the big five-letter word. It's not a, not a full, uh, yeah, I think it's five-letter word. Here's the big five-letter word, not four-letter word, okay? Here's the big five-letter word. The big five-letter word is this, trust, okay? What it comes down to is trust, trust. Lord, I trust you. I don't know why you allowed this. I don't know why I'm going through it. I don't know why it had to happen, but I trust you. So I give you thanks. The will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us is that we trust him so much in spite of how, what we're going through, how it feels, how terrible it is, we can give him thanks, all right? That's the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. Let me see here. Uh, 
Let me see. Yeah, well, I don't have time to find that. But here's the thing. But that, that's what it is. So, so, but, so in the midst of all these things that are happening, and then we, say, we might say to ourselves, well, well, why is God, well, why is God allowing it? Well, number one, well, I don't know if, I'm not so much in order of priority, but one reason is we have free will. So God allows things because we have free will. And we, we make choices and decisions and so on. And you know, people, people, get in, people go to a bar, they sit at home, and then decide to go out and, and, and drive their car and go to Walmart or whatever. And in the process, they, they have an accident, hit somebody, and kill some people. You know? uh, and, and, and so can we say that's God's will? No, that's, that was the devil influencing that whole, orchestrating that whole situation that led to someone's death and, and harm and all like that. That was Satan. That's the devil. Jesus said in John 10.10, he called Satan the thief. He said, the thief cometh not before to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, but I am come that you might have life. He said, Jesus said he came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly, in abundance to the full, to the low flows. But Satan, he calls a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. First Peter 5 and 8, he's called the devourer, all right? And I call John 10, 10 Satan's mission statement. That, that's what his, his goal, steal, kill, destroy. And so when things like that happen, accidents, whatever, it's, it's nothing but the work of the devil, influencing people to make bad choices and all that kind of stuff, especially when they're under the influence, right? And, and so, uh, but like I said, in the midst of, we give God things. So, but, but here's the thing. Number one, God allows things because we have free will, all right? All the poverty, lack, hunger. I worked with a guy years ago, nicest, one of the nicest people I ever met. One of the nicest people, always just had a great attitude, smiling and all that kind of stuff. And I thought for sure, man, this guy is just such a nice guy, and this is just the way he was towards everybody. Everybody liked him. I said he must be he must be a Christian because he, you know I mean Christians aren't perfect, but he just had such a way about him. And um, so I, I mentioned God or something. I mentioned to him one day, and he said his his response was, you know, I would. He says, you know, and I think of all he thought of all the children starving in the world and all the things that children go through and children children. He said I can't serve a God who would allow such a thing. Well. You know why God's allowing it? Because that's man's will. There is enough food in this world that not one child has to ever go hungry. I don't care where they are in the world, third world countries. We people in the United States, mission organizations and, and churches and whatever like that, send food to these starving people, dig, go and dig wells and so they can have clean water and like that in these countries and so on because there's enough resources in the world that no one ever has to go hungry, no one has to go without clean water, no one has to go without, no one has to go without medical help. And the sad part about it is even in some of these third world countries where people are suffering in that way, it's not because everybody's broke. The whole country is not broke. The whole country is not filled with people. There are wealthy people in those countries, but they don't choose to take care of their poor and needy and all like that. But the point is, you know, but that's what men, if you have a country where the, where the wealth and all like that don't take care, or don't care about their, 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 their people in need and all like that, that's their choice. God sees that they're, they're, that's not necessary. You know, in Ezekiel, it talks about that was one of the issues that God had with Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, not only was all the abominations and things like that happening, and that's why God, those, one of the reasons God destroyed it, but the other reason mentioned in Ezekiel is they didn't care for their poor and needy, all right? And so the, 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 the things that are happening in the world today, and, you know, and as sad as, as, as much as this man, I can understand how he feels, you know, about, oh, the children starve and all that kind of stuff. I wonder what he feels about abortion, you know? Uh, he, he, may, he may feel it's so terrible that, you know, children, there's children in the world starving and dying and all like that, but he may be, an, he may be someone who, who's, who's a... Who, who, is, a, is, a, is pro-abortion, for all I know. You know what I mean? Because we just, the, the mindsets that we have about things, it's, it's a, you know, one, in one area you're mad about it, but another. So, but the thing is, oh, Lord. But the, <laughs> yeah, okay. But the point is, you know, why does God allow these things? First of all, he, God we get, has given us free will. And if we make choices and so on, then he, that's what he has to do. God finds a way. So you know what God does? People in these, some of these countries that could be taking care of their poor and needy and they don't and all that kind of stuff. You know what God does? God touches people in America 
and in other countries of the world and his and churches and missions groups and missionaries and all these different you know uh, 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 social needs groups whoever they are and you know what they do they send they send missionaries and they send people and they send food and they send help and all that kind of stuff and they dig wells and they make sure the people have clean water and they do all those things and they send clothing and and so that's how God gets around the the the, the, the evil that's in men's heart the greed the greed and the evil that's in men's hearts where they won't take care of their poor and needy for whatever their reasons, okay? God has a way. So, yeah, but he allows it, but then he has a way. But that's number one, free will. Now, the other reason is this. There are things that God allows because I know some people are angry. They don't understand why God will allow this, why God will allow that. Well, you may never understand because he's God and you're not, Okay? <laughs> That's why. Well, how come? How, you will never understand. Well, I, I, how come I can't understand? Well, he's God and you're not. And if you could understand under everything that God did, you know what that would mean? That would mean you're on God's level. You're on God's level. It's like a three-year-old picks up the scissors and starts running through the house with it, okay? That three-year-old has no idea the kind of harm and hurt and whatever he could do to himself and others running through the house with the scissors, Okay? So what do you do? You run over, oh, no, 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 no. And you grab that scissors, all right, and you take the scissors, and you say, no, honey, you know, you, you're going to hurt yourself. You could hurt yourself, blah, blah, blah. And the child says, no, nah, he's mad. And that child screams and cries and throws a fit because it wants the scissors. Now, you, as the adult, understand why you had to take that scissors, why it was necessary, and so on. That three-year-old has no clue. And until that child is old enough, mature enough, then maybe they'll understand. But at where they are, it's an, it's it's you can't explain it. You can't sit that two-year-old down at three and say, "Listen, I took it because you would hurt yourself." You know what that you know what that two-year-old three-year-old is gonna say you say to you? Here's what they're gonna say: "But I want it." You ever seen that? You know, but honey, you can't have it. You're gonna hurt yourself. You know what they're gonna then and used to because listen. It's sharp and it has a point, and you could fall on it, or you could cut yourself, you could hurt yourself, you could kill yourself. Oh, you know, so you can't have it. You know what? That the child's not gonna say, "Oh, yes, mom, father, dearest, I understand." That three-year-old's gonna say, "But I want it." I've seen that happen. But but I want it. See, and that's the way we are. God, Adam, Eve saw that fruit. Satan deceived her. She saw that fruit. The Bible says she saw it was good, pleasant. Good to the eye, a, 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 a fruit, or something to be desired, to make men wise, and like that. And she ate of the fruit. Why? Because I want it. And she wanted it. And Adam, whatever his reason was, he 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 wasn't deceived. But but that's but I want it. See, that's what that's what the kids say. So we're not on God's level. And 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 sometimes God will explain it to you. Sometimes won't. And I think the reason, the times when God doesn't explain it, is because. He, you're not going to get it anyway, okay? You don't, we don't have the capacity. Like a two-year-old does not have the capacity to understand, all right, why they shouldn't run through the house with the scissors, all right, or whatever else three, two and two-year-olds do, all right, why they shouldn't knock the thing over, uh, you know, the milk in it and just throw it on the floor or whatever. They don't have the capacity to understand in many cases. And so, yeah, you do have some very intelligent kids sometimes, but you know, you know what I mean. So what happens is, you don't give an explanation. Sometimes, you know, you just take it. You know, you just do it. You just allow it, whatever, because they don't. So God is not always going to give you an explanation because you don't have the capacity to understand it anyway. So that's what he says in Isaiah 55 and verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. My thoughts are not your thoughts. God doesn't think like we think. God doesn't do things the way we do things. And although, man, we think we're so smart, we think we're so intelligent, we think we got it all together, we think we got it going on, no matter how smart and educated and how many degrees you have or whatever, you still don't know as much as God. And so his thoughts are in our thoughts. His ways are in our ways. And yeah, you might have some good ideas, and whatever, but, but, but they're nothing, they're nothing, they're nothing in comparison to God's thoughts and ways and ideas. And here's the thing. He says, he says for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, that word higher, one of the words that, 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 that's also translated from that original Hebrew word is above. My thoughts, my, my thoughts are above your thoughts. My ways are above your ways, okay? 
And, and that, that, word, that dealing with above and higher, okay, you know, it means that he's, he's coming from a, a, a greater, much more informed, greater intelligence and information, all of that, greater information, you know, uh, uh, intelligence, much, 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 much more, infinitely more, you know, intelligent and so on than we, would, we could ever be. See, because God knows the past and the present, but here's what he knows that we have no clue of, the, the future, the future. And I don't care how much we think we know. So let's say, let's take something simple like baking a cake. So you put all the ingredients, you follow the box, the recipe, and you put all the ingredients in it and whatever. You did everything, you put it in the oven on 350 for 40 minutes or whatever, and you tested it and you pulled the toothpick out or the knife out, there's nothing on it, whatever is supposed to happen. And you said, good, it's good. You let it sit for a minute and then you cut it and something went wrong. And, and you did it all right, but something went wrong, and, and it didn't come out right. It, 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 it didn't rise. It did. Something went wrong. Now, you did everything. Now, now, here's the thing. Now, you had no idea that, that, was, that it wasn't going to. I'm saying that I, I just thought of how years ago my aunt used to make this cake. She made one of the most awesome pound cakes. She had this pound cake recipe, and she used to make these pound cakes. And you, I, never, I haven't had anything like it since, or, and she's with the Lord now. You know, but I'm going to tell you, she had this most awesome pound cake recipe and one day I said, you know, give me the recipe. And she did. Now, I don't know if she gave it to me wrong or I put, you know, when it was a, it was a, it was a from scratch. It was a homemade, it wasn't, it was a scratch recipe. And the thing that, see, at the time I didn't know, at the time I didn't know that when you, someone gives you a scratch recipe, you have to follow it step by step. You can't just, well, let me put the eggs in now. No, if it, if it says this, then this, then this, then this, you can't skip a step and throw stuff in when you want to. Well, the eggs are here now. Let me throw them in now. No, you got the fault, you know? So, but here's the thing. So when I made, I followed that recipe, and it didn't come out right. The texture of the cake was all wrong. It, it tastes good, but it's all wrong. And I said to her, it didn't come out right. She just laughed because she knew, she probably knew whatever it is. But, but the thing is, I didn't know it was going to, I, I did everything I was supposed to do. I didn't know it was going to come out right. You know who knew? God knew. See, we make plans, and we just think this is going to work, and we're convinced it's going to work, and God sits and says, that's not going to work. He knows, you see, but God knows because he knows the future. So when God does something or God allows something, God does it and allows it knowing exactly what the outcome is going to be. He knows exactly what the outcome is going to be. He knows the outcome. He knows exactly what the outcome is going to be. He knows. You see, we hope, we guess, we think, you know, and so on. But he knows. So based on knowing, he's making it from a higher, his thoughts. You know, when I think of higher, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher, my thoughts are higher. You know, my ways are higher. If you're, if you're in a situation where, you're, you're, let's say you're looking, you're waiting for someone, looking for something, like you see these war movies or whatever it might be, cowboy movies, and the enemy's coming, okay? And they're going to send someone, I want you to go look out, watch for the enemy, watch when they're coming, and so on. They don't tell them, go down in that valley and go sit down in that valley in that low spot right there and then get down in there and watch for them. Well, by the time they see them in that low spot, they're going to be on you, you're going to be in trouble. What do they do? They say, Climb up to that top of that mountain. Go up to the top of that mountain and watch for the enemy. Climb that tree. Climb that thing. When they make a lookout post, you know where the lookout post is? High. If, you, if they had a fort and they made the walls of the fort, well, the lookout post is going to be even higher than the walls. You go to a prison and you see the guard tower, where the guard tower is watching over the, everything that's happening. You know where the guard tower is? It's not over in the corner down in a, in a valley, gully somewhere or whatever. It's high. The walls are high, and the tower is even higher because you want to have a higher perspective. You want to be above everything. We have a higher perspective. So when God allows something or God does something, he's doing it from a higher place, a higher, whether of intelligence, of knowledge, wisdom, and so on, and, and of, of, of sight, what he can see. He sees so much further into the future. He not only sees the beginning, but he sees the end. He is the Alpha and he's the omega. He said, I'm the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, the A to Z, okay? That's who God is, all right? And so here's what God told me a couple weeks ago. We ministered this at church. He said, what God does, because you say, well, why would God do this, and why does God do that, and why did God allow this? No. You know what? God does and allows many things because he sees what he called the big picture. God, and I know you've heard that term, terminology before. 
the big picture. God sees the big picture. We see the picture. We, we believe and we hope, but God sees the big picture. And so many times he's allowing some things because he sees the big picture. So let me see here. In Genesis, in the book of Genesis, Genesis 37, Joseph was the son of Jacob, and he had these dreams. And uh, uh, he dreamed that, his, you know, that he was going to be in an exalted position and so on. His brothers hated him, and they sold him into slavery. Then he ends up in prison. But from that whole situation, slavery and prison, he ends up as the governor of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh, riding in one of Pharaoh's chariots, married to a princess, and he interprets Pharaoh's dreams and saves the world, not just Egypt and his family. Joseph saved the world of his day, all right? Now, uh, he might have been in prison, might have been in slavery, wondering why would God allow me to, but later on when, when his brothers come to get food and all that, he says, God sent me ahead of you to preserve life, all right? Because God saw the famine and what was coming, all right? And God allowed those things so he could be in place in order to save the world, to save the world. Well, in the midst of it, in the midst of brothers wanting to beat him up and they want to kill him and then sell him into slavery, from slavery is falsely accused, and he ends up in, in prison. In the midst of all that, I don't know if Joseph saw the big picture. He just saw the picture. He saw what it is. But God was allowing it because he saw what was coming. And sometimes God will allow, here's, here's how he gave it to me. God will allow something bad, okay, in order to prevent something worse. God will allow something bad to prevent something worse, all right? So sometimes there might be something bad happening, but God is allowing that something bad because he's, 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 it's going to prevent something worse. There are people that have been through some things, okay? And because of what they went through, because maybe even a choice, they made a choice, they made a decision, they did something, whatever, and then the outcome was tragic or, or horrific or bad or whatever. So you know what? Whatever they did, it left an impression on their mind. And I can guarantee you, because of that, that is something that they will never, ever, 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 ever do again. And you know what? God wants that. That's the attitude. God, that's the mindset and so on that God wants them to have. Because God sees that in the future, that decision would have been even worse. The, the, the consequences, the, the tragedy, and so would have been even worse. Okay. So you have a person that, 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 that falls asleep behind the wheel, and they have an accident, and they survive, and everybody's okay. Why did God allow that? Well, maybe God saw in the future that same person was going to be riding with his wife and his four children in the car and, and a relative in the car and the van and the minivan or whatever, and they fell asleep, and they all died. So God allowed, just an example, a possibility, right? So God allowed this thing where they had a little accident, people, they were okay, to, to, to prevent, you know, something worse, okay? So, that, so, so, again, the key word in all of this is that terrible five-letter word, trust. You have to trust God. But he says, so, but God sees the big picture. And as I said, sometime God will allow something bad to, in order for the, to prevent something worse, all right? Now, um, you know, and there's so many people I can think of. Joseph is one of them. Daniel, when, Daniel in the lion's den. You know, king, the king says, don't worship any other god but me. He's God and all like that. Daniel still prayed three times a day with the windows open. Well, he ends up in the lion's den. Well, everybody, when he got out of that lion's den, the king makes a decree, and, and everyone begins to serve Daniel's God. Same thing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They wouldn't bow to Nebuchadnezzar's image in Daniel chapter 3. And what happened as a result of that? Well, they got thrown in the fiery furnace. But Jesus, King Nebuchadnezzar, said, we put three men in, I, men in, I see four, and the fourth looks like, like as unto the Son of God, or the Son of one of the gods, in some translations it says. And so what happened then? The king makes a decree. Everybody's going to worship and serve. God, their God is God, all right? So in the end, then they got promoted. So, so God allows some things. He sees the big picture, okay? And he allows something bad to prevent something even worse, all right? So, and there's so many, I could go on and on with that type of thing. Now, um, let's see here. Uh, let me see. Uh, let me see. Well, Acts chapter 16. Let me look real quick at Acts chapter 16. Then I'm going to get into, get into something else real quick. Uh, I know I wrote down this Acts chapter 16. Hmm, let me see here. Uh... No, so let me see. I'm not sure why I wrote that down, but 
Uh, let's see here. What's this say? Well, all right. So let me move on from that because I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Yeah, I I, understand. I see what that is now. All right. But I'm not. But hit, but but see. So God doesn't do things the way we do them. And as I said, God will allow something bad in order for, to prevent something worse. But it's because He sees the big picture. The big picture is something worse is coming. So let me. I'll allow this this thing over here because it's going to prevent this this bigger thing, this bigger tragedy from taking place, and so on. And thank God for that for His that He does. So now, the other thing I want to tell you is this, and this kind of, this is what we ministered last week, and it kind of goes it, along with this. And in the midst of, because see, in the midst of, in the midst of God allowing things, God's thoughts on our thoughts, neither are his ways, our ways. In the midst of God allowing things sometimes, all right, uh, 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 that, that some, something bad to prevent something worse, in the midst of God allowing something that we don't like and I like that, you know what many times is going to happen? We're not going to be happy. It's not going to make you happy. Whatever it is, you, you know, you don't like it, you're upset, it's bothering you, it's troubling you, you're mad about it, whatever. And you know what? You're not happy. Well, guess what? <laughs> God's goal, God's purpose is not, has nothing to do with your, your being happy. And there are a lot of people today, you know, they make decisions and they do things based on being happy. Well, if your goal and your whole purpose in life is for you to be happy, all right? I'm not happy. Well, if your goal and your purpose in life is all about your happiness, I tell you what, not only are you going to be happy, but there's going to be a, a lot of people, a whole lot of people around you that are not happy as well, because you're going to be doing things that are very selfish and self-centered or whatever that are going to be causing issues and problems and trouble for other people, all because your purpose and your goal and your desire is for you to be happy. And many times in order for someone to be happy, that means someone else is not going to be happy. All right? But, and, and, but, but the thing is, happiness is not the goal and the purpose in life anyway. All right? But if, if, but if that's your thing, you know, uh, uh, some people say, well, see, yeah. <laughs> yeah. well, I don't know if I get into that one yet, but let me, let me read. Uh, let me see. So uh, let me see here. I was watching the other night. There was a there was a show that called you know the Price is Right. I know you might know the show The Price is Right. So I'm watching The Price is Right. My daughter and I. It was The Price is Right at night. Okay, so it came on around eight o'clock. The Price is Right at night. And usually The Price is Right at night, they give away these extravagant prizes. It's you know they give away Mercedes and Porsches or whatever and that kind of stuff. And matter of fact, the young man who won might have been 12 years old. The show was it not only was Price is Right at night, but it was children. It was children's night or whatever. So these children were there with one of their parents. Some of them had their father, some had their mother. Well, the young man who won the, uh, 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 the big, it was not the, not the big deal, the um, Showcase Showdown, I think it's called. Big deal is the other show. Uh, uh, let's make a deal. But the one who won the Showcase Showdown was a young man, maybe 10, 12 years old, 12 years old maybe, young, with his mother. He won an a, a, a Audi SUV, a trip to Florida for four and something, whatever, whatever else. Seventy-four, seventy-five thousand dollars worth of prize. That that's with his with his other win. Seventy-five thousand dollars worth of prizes. That's what he won. Okay, but during the midst of the show, you know they were, they they're doing the little bidding things, and you get get up on stage, and then you do the game and all like that. And here's the thing: they were, as they bid to get on stage, some kids would get the prize, some didn't. So some kids never got on stage. And then the ones who got on stage and played the games, one kid, I think he did the plinko thing. He won about $12,000 with Plinko. But the other kid, he didn't win his thing. He had, a, he had a game. He didn't win his game. And Drew Carey, when one of the kids didn't win, he just looked so sad. Drew Carey said, man, there's some life lessons happening here today. You know, and what's the life lesson? Well, you know, you're not always going to win. Things aren't always going to go your way. Not always turn out the way you expect and want like that in life. And so God makes it work together for good in the end and, so, and all that. But that, that's how life is. And so if, if your goal in life and your purpose and your goal and your desire, you have to be happy. And, as, and if as a parent, if as a parent, your goal and your desire and all that in life is that your children are happy, you want happy kids, my children, you know what? You're gonna be, you're gonna be a terrible parent and you're gonna raise some brats. You're gonna raise some, 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 some brats, some spoiled, rotten kids. That's what you're gonna raise. Because they're not gonna understand that things are aren't always going to go their way. They're not going to understand 
that they're not always going to get their way and they're not always going to be happy. I, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to be married to them or whatever, friends with them, because they're not going to be. They're not going to be that good of a person. They need to understand that many times in life there's there's sacrifices. Many times in life you do what's what's best for the good of all. See, God does things for the for the best for for the good of all, not for the good of one. But the person whose desire and their their thing, their goal is just they have to be happy. They don't care about anyone or anything but themselves. You see. Forget the good of all and all that, right? <laughs> so, and, and here's the thing. You know, I pray that you're, you're saved and you're born again and you want to be saved. And maybe when we pray the prayer, give the invitation at the end of the program, you'll want to be saved. But let me just tell you, there's no way in the Bible that God promised happiness. So if you're going to get saved thinking, well, once I get saved, I'll be happy. Well, that's not, that's not a promise that God made. You might be happier than you are right now, but that's not what God has promised. So in Isaiah 26 and verse 3, it says, God says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. The thing that God definitely has promised to us is peace. And believe me, there are people with millions of dollars and have no peace. There are people with fame and fortune and all kind of stuff, and, and, all, and they have no peace. They got degrees, education, and they have no peace. God's promise, the thing that he said he'll give us is not just peace, but perfect peace. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed in thee. But listen to the next part. And the next word says is because, so here's the reason, here's the way it's going to come about. Because, that's a big word right there. Because he trusteth in thee. You know what I like to say? No trust, no peace. Trust comes from, I should say peace comes from trusting God. No trust no peace. No trust, no peace. If you trust God, you'll have peace. And when it says, thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Whose mind. What, is, what does it mean when it says whose mind? Because a lot of times we say to people, God, God said he'll keep you in perfect peace. They, think they don't even leave the part, they didn't mention the part about his mind is stayed on thee. God says he'll keep you in perfect peace. But, but here's the thing. Whose mind is stayed on thee. It's conditional. Whose mind is stayed on thee. So the peace comes from keeping your mind on him. Well, what does that mean? How do you do that? Are you just all day just thinking about God sitting on his throne and the angels going around the throne crying, holy, holy. Is that what it is? No. Your mind stayed on him is that your mind is on his word, his promise, his covenant. So you're going through something and your mind is on the, the word that says, he always causes me to triumph, 2 Corinthians 2.14. You know, you're, you're going through some things and your word is on uh, Isaiah and uh, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 1557, something like that. You know, thanks be unto God who's given us the victory. You're going through some things and, and, and your mind is on Romans 8, 28, and we know all things work together for good. Those, that's what your mind is on his word. You know, uh, 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 your mind is on Psalms 23. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil thou art with me. Now, your mind is on that because God is his word. You can't separate God from his word. So when he says the mind is stayed on him, it means you're not focused on, you're not focused on the circumstances and what's happening and what's going on. Your mind is on the word. Your mind is on your covenant. Your mind is on what God said. Because in the end, that's what's going to matter and that's what's going to happen. So he says, then he says, because he trusts Now, if you don't trust God, you can't keep your mind on him. Your mind will be on plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, plan, plan, plan 58, you know, D and all that. Your, your mind will be on all the possibilities and things that you can do. But when you trust God, your mind is just on him. And so the promise of God is peace, perfect peace. Matter of fact, in Philippians chapter 4, he also says, Philippians 4, be careful, in verse 6, Philippians 4, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, should keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God. So you're going through something. Don't be anxious. Don't worry. Pray. Give it to God. Give him some thanks. Make your petitions and requests and so on. Give him the praise and the thanks. And then here's what happens. Then you get peace. That's a promise from God. Happiness? Happiness is your, is your responsibility. Happiness is, is what you, you have to do. Happiness is not God's end, you know, end, uh, uh, end game. All right? Happiness is what... You, you know, what God wants us, he, he causes us to triumph. He, he says in 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper, be in health, even as your soul prospers. So God causes you to triumph. He wants you to be in health and have peace and so on. But his happiness, 
you know, happiness is like an emotion. It's, it's not one of the fruit of the Spirit or so on, gifts of the Spirit. Uh, let me see here. But see, but, but the purpose, really, our purpose really is to please God, not ourselves. Um, let me see. Let, let's look at, real quick at Hebrews chapter 11. And then I'll read Revelations, and maybe then we'll be, about, yeah, I think I have a little time here. So Hebrews chapter 11, and maybe we'll start at verse 24. It says here, 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, Hebrews 11, 23, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. What was the king's commandment? The king had commanded. Pharaoh said to the, to the midwives, any child, any male child, if it's a male child, kill it. Kill all the male children. So when, when, when Moses' parents, when he was born, they were supposed to kill him. He was supposed to die. He wasn't supposed to live. But they defied the king because they saw Moses was a goodly child. God, they knew that God had a plan for his life and, and so on. So what did they do? By faith. But th listen to this. So, so they, she built the ark and sent him down, and Pharaoh's daughter raised him, adopted and raised him. So he ends up as Pharaoh's grandson. He's being raised in Pharaoh's palace and so on, fed, educated, all like that as a grandson of Pharaoh, okay, and, um, and uh, 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 God protecting him and all like that, okay, but it's, so it says, but when he came, was older, by the, then he finds out, he, whatever, at some point he finds out he's adopted, he finds out he's actually a Hebrew, and he finds out the people that they're persecuting and enslaved and all like that, those are his people, he's one of them, but he still could have been, he could have stayed in the palace as Pharaoh's grandson you know, and all like that, and enjoyed that. But here's what it says, Hebrews 11, verse 24, by, by, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter raised him. She adopted him. She, that was, she treated him like a son. He was being treated like Pharaoh's grand. Pharaoh, which means he's Pharaoh's grandson. Whatever he wants, his, your, his wish is your command. He can have whatever, whatever's going to please him, make him feel good, whatever, be, make him happy. Right? He, he can have it. You better give it to him. That's Pharaoh's grandson. All right? Pharaoh's daughter's son. And it says, when he was coming to us, he refused. But listen, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Man, think about the happiness. Think about the happiness that he could have uh, experienced as Pharaoh's grandson. That was, that was his crossroad. That was the choice he had to make. Do I stay in this lifestyle, the lifestyle of the rich and famous, this lavish life of Pharaoh's grandson, and just enjoy the pleasures of Egypt for the rest of my life and all that, right? Or, what, or do I choose to suffer with the, people, with, with the people of God? Well, it says, when he came to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people that choosing, he chose to suffer affliction, happiness or affliction, happiness... Most people, they're going with happiness. Happiness or affliction. They chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Enjoy the pleasure. What makes him happy? Sin or, 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 or affliction? Happiness or affliction? Which one? Most people, they're choosing happiness. Affliction? What? I got to be happy because I'm happy. I don't know the rights to that song, right? We got to be happy. Happy people and all that, right? All that. We got songs about it. But, but you know what? As for people of God, we have to realize that it says, listen, choosing rather, he said, affliction with the people of God, than to enjoy. Sin has pleasure. And if you're sinning and getting no pleasure, you, you're not sinning. You're not doing it right, okay? If you're sinning and it's, you're not having pleasure, somehow you, you're not doing it right or something because the reason people sin is because it has pleasure. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, all right? By faith, he forsook Egypt. Uh, 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 not fearing the wrath of the king, all right? Now, the next thing I want to tell you is this. In verse 32, And what shall I say more, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak uh, uh, and of Samson of, uh, and of uh, Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, this is telling you all the, all the accolades and, and, and accomplishments of David and Samuel and Samson and all these men. Gideon, with his 300, you know, overcame all the, 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 his enemies and so on. David, uh, Goliath, and all the things he did. And, and Samuel and Samson, you know, uh, killed a thousand Philistines with a jawbone of an ass. 
All these awesome things. Listen, verse 35. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured. But see, and so it first tells you all the good things that they experienced, all the awesome victories and all like that. But then it was also some other things they went through. Women received their dead raised. All right, man, listen to that, raised. Women receiving their dead, their, their sons, their daughters, their husbands, and so on. Raised from the dead. Wow, how awesome is that? Raised to life again. And uh, But listen, but there's, and others, see, but there was others. See, so on one side, yeah, these people are experiencing all these awesome things, victories and awesome things. But others, <clears throat> and others, were tortured. So while some people were experiencing these things, others were being tortured, not, ex not accepting deliverance. They didn't accept deliverance. They were tortured that they might obtain a better resurrection for the, for the sake of the gospel and so on, for the sake of, the, of their relationship with God, their covenant with God. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. They were scourged like Jesus. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment, thrown into prison, put in bonds. That's what Saul, who, whose name was changed to Paul, who went on to write most of the New Testament, that's what he was doing on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9 going to get letters so that he could to be authorized to, 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 to imprison and, and persecute Christians. That's what Saul did before God met him on the road to Damascus, changed his name to Paul, all right? Listen, they were stoned. They, listen, they, they were stoned, not high stoned, but stoned with rocks and killed, throwing rocks on at them, stones and killed. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted, were slain by the sword. Sawn asunder, sawn, you know what I mean? cut in half. They weren't cut in half after they were dead or while they were drugged and they couldn't feel it and given some kind of pain. They were cut in half while they were alive. Okay? You know, I know the magician does that and saws the lady, but this was for real, cutting people in half. Imagine that. And here we are today as Christians. Man, if, we, if something, we, we're going to a church and the preacher preaches a message, we don't like it, and we're not happy. I'm not happy here. You know, we're out of there. You know, you're in a marriage, something is, he, he's not making you happy. He's doing everything, but somehow you're not happy. I don't know, whatever it is, you know, things, you know, a job, different things. You just think you got to be, oh, happiness is not the, the end goal, right? The thing we're supposed to be is pleasing God. Everything was created to give God pleasure, okay? In Revelation chapter 4, just in case, your job, my job, you know what our job is while we're here? To give God pleasure. Not to be happy. Our job is to give God pleasure. Re Revelation chapter 4. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. Everything we see, you know, consider, and understand was created by God. And for thy pleasure, they are and were created. We are here to please God. Not for God to get, oh God, I'm not happy. You know, it's not for God to give us pleasure. And God will give you pleasure. There's, there's, there's talks about the scripture in Psalms 35 says, He has pleasure in the prosperity of his service. Jesus said it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So God gives pleasure, and, 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 but, but we're supposed to give him pleasure. Lord, I thank you for this word. I thank you for those that are watching. Listen, if you don't know Jesus and the pardoning of your sin, and I know you want to be saved and give God pleasure, and he'll give you some pleasure, say this with me right now. Dear God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I confess that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I believe Jesus is your only begotten son. I believe he came. I believe he died. I believe you raised him on the third day, and I believe he's coming back again. So come into my heart. Fill me with your spirit. Baptize me in your Holy Ghost with a manifestation of all the gifts and the fruit of the spirit. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Amen. If you said that prayer, you're saved. You're born again. You're on your way to heaven. If I don't see you in time, I'll see you in eternity. I got to go. My time is up. I wish I had more time, but I don't. Listen, Jesus Christ came that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. So stop dying and live, live, live. Thank you for tuning in to The Time Is Now with Pastor E.I. Osborne Jr. and friends. We pray that this message has been a blessing to you. If you would like some information on anything you heard in today's episode or to find out how you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ, please call us at 508 746-4085. If you would like a copy of this message, further information about our ministry, or to make a donation, please visit our website at www.eiosborne.org or correspond by mail at The Time Is Now, P.O. Box 3642, Plymouth, Massachusetts, 02361. On behalf of the ministry, thank you.